Welcome to this 100th episode of CEO Perspectives. I'm Steve Odlin from the Conference Board and the host of this podcast series. And over the past few years, we've brought you timely insights on geopolitics, the war in Ukraine, global economy, the evolving workplace, just to name a few things. And that's what we're going to continue to do today as we talk about an issue in everybody's mind, the banking crisis, the most recent banking crisis. It seems like we have them every 10 years or so. The recent collapse of two banks in the United States and more internationally has set off a panic through the banking sector. What really happened here and why and what went wrong and how can we prevent that in the future? You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Joining me today is Hollis Hart, the former head of international for Citi. He's also a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development, which is the public policy center of the Conference Board and a senior fellow for our economic center. Hollis, thanks so much for joining us today. Steve, I'm flattered to be here. So Hollis, you know, we've had two banks here in the U.S. that have failed recently, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Can you just help us understand what happened and why? Well, Steve, in the simplest terms, they failed because they did not have sufficient access to cash to meet depositors' demands. Silicon Valley Bank was the most extreme in that they placed roughly $80 billion of overnight deposits in up to 10-year fixed rate instruments. Yeah. So what that means is, you know, they were taking in deposits, they were making loans on the short term, but they were lending on the very long term, right? Which so they had a mismatch in tenors. They had a they the the single most dangerous issue for a bank is that mismatch in tenors. You it's just a sacred principle not to take in, you have to match tenors. Now, you know, if there was a static interest rate world, right, where, you know, the interest rates weren't fluctuating on bonds, then the prices wouldn't fluctuate. And, you know, maybe this could have been averted, but that's not the world we're in. We're in a world of rising interest rates. Talk about how that has played a role. Well, Steve, actually, even if everything was static, the, the issue is accessibility to the cash and the ability to be able to liquidate those instruments fast enough. So even there, by mismatching, they had put themselves at risk. Uh, right now, in this world, uh, they compounded with the, mo- the real world movements. Uh, they had three things go wrong for them. One is they couldn't access that cash. Two, digital made it easy for people to move very quickly, very fast, which accelerated the issue. And then they they did have the losses, which were public and exacerbated by some of the communications and some of the decisions they had made in the marketplace. So they really, it was uh, a little bit of a perfect storm of bad decisions on their part and bad luck. Yeah. And you said that this was just basically an old fashioned bank run. Now, you know, when you think of bank runs, you think of the 1930s and the people lining up outside of the banks and you go, well, how can that happen in this in this world? But describe what a bank run is and how can that happen in this today's world? Well, the, it, it unfortunately, from a bank perspective, it's just a nature of, of the world. There are two issues. One is the psychology, which you touch on, and that is people, in fact, the rumor, and that's where the digital technology has, in fact, accelerated things dramatically. But the second is the reality. Uh, For example, the the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, an excellent, excellent regulator, used to require a minimum of four days of cash on hand versus average withdrawals. And then they would move that to six to eight as they saw risk. Uh, it's just part, it is part of what being in a bank is. You have to worry about the ability to meet uh, clients' withdrawals. So a bank run is basically, as as you said, it's basically when you have customers trying to take cash out of the bank at a rapidly accelerating pace, you know, and exacerbated by social media and the, you know, people are going, hey, you know, this bank's going to run out of cash, better get there while the getting's good. 
and they all go in and they crash it all at once. But the bank's not sitting on all that cash because they've already invested it. Well, that's where they have, they really, well, let me give you the simple answer. They have to match tenors. Not matching tenors is a, is a sin. It's a venal sin. Now, on inside baseball, what the regulators and the banks do is they look at core deposits and they say, which of your historic deposits are there going to be there and so sticky, those you can start to lend out for longer tenors. In this case, and, but that's generally a small, uh, not a large percentage of your deposits. In, and that's what Warren Buffett does actually with his float uh, at Berkshire Hathaway, but he's got very sticky deposits. This was hot money. 90%, maybe even a higher number, were visibly hot money in the sense they were, they were large deposits from tech companies. These were not widows and orphans keeping their deposits in the bank. So the bank had to structure the way it ran its treasury to recognize that vulnerability. They, they gave themselves no error margin. They were, in fact, it was they they were on the far side of the risk taking from my perspective yeah and essentially they didn't have enough then they didn't have enough cash and then they had to start liquidating their their long term assets and you, which had... and you can't do that quickly 20 years ago 30 years ago there were literally 10 times as many participants in the treasury market and they each kept giant inventories starting actually in 2000 but then absolutely reinforced by everything that the regulations did in 2008, 90% of those players said, I'm not in the business. And the remainder shrank their inventories and something critical happened. The, the market maker function where somebody said, I'm always going to be there, gone. There's only one market maker today. And that's unfortunately the Fed. The Fed has become the market maker of last resort. And that's what you saw. So the treasury market, as with other asset classes, and I don't want to be scary, but today's markets are so thin that people are at risk of price dislocation. They can't get a reasonable price or maybe not even being able to sell in a timely manner. And that's a risk that right. might not have been there 30 years ago. Right. So what I hear you saying is, that in fact, this was, re you know, the, if you think about it in terms of was it psychology or reality? Well, it, it was reality because they weren't liquid enough. But the psychology then contributed to the demand of the cash and therefore contributed to the reality of uh, of the situation. And essentially, they couldn't respond fast enough. And they had to, they had to, they just collapsed right, and, right before our very and eyes. And we could couple with that, that the, uh, the treasury was a little bit asleep at the at the at the uh, wheel. They could have possibly opened up the window on Thursday and said, "Bring us your securities now." They could have perhaps ameliorated the 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 damage. It's not clear that that could have saved Silicon Valley Bank, but it is. It was something where the regulators certainly were slow initially uh, reacting. Yeah. Well, and, you know, you never know in situations like this, if there hadn't been a demand, you know, by their depositors, and if some people hadn't been tweeting things, and if, 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 maybe it wouldn't, have, but, who, but it did. And that's your point, which is that, you know, it, the, the world's changed and we need to think about it. But, you know, Hollis, you know, we just went through this massive bank crisis in 2008 and 2009. It created a huge, I, well, I thought of it as a depression, but it's certainly a big recession. It took us almost a decade to recover. We had all of these regulations that were passed. I mean, you've been an expert at uh, describing this over time. I thought that was supposed to fix everything. What happened? Well, first, no set of regulations will ever eliminate all risk, nor would you want them to be so draconian that there was zero risk, because then there would be no credit extension. What did happen are two things. One is, in this case, you have 
such a basic error of not matching tenors and not having sufficient cash on hand that n that it, there is no set of regulations that would have addressed such basic, simple 101 error management in what's called treasury management or ALCO management, asset liability management. Second, I will say that if anything, there's a strong school of thought that the regulations that were put in place were in fact so excessive that they that the regulators and the banks ended up they ended up being dysfunctional for example the stress tests and living wills went to 50,000 pages 80,000 pages in the most extreme no one uses those they in fact would have been perhaps much more effective if they were 25 pages and so as a consequence the regulations did several negative things they distracted people into believing that by having 50,000 pages, you would somehow protected people. They took away tremendous resources that could have been used on basic things like hiring risk officers and treasury officers and improving the systems. And they kept people from focusing on the really high exocet missile risks that sink the ships. And so from that point of view, you could almost say that the utility of the regulations, because they were so excessive, ended up almost backfiring. Okay, so let, let's go back to how do banks work? Okay, so banks take deposits. They take money in from depositors. Yep. They then use that. They they take those funds and they make loans. Yep. Not all of it, but, but partially. They take the rest and they invest it to make more money. In, and that's what gives them the profit and the cushion to make more loans. So there's I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm way oversimplifying it for the experts, but essentially that's what it is. So, so you have to, so banks have to make money by making loans and and making investments, but at the same time they've got to be liquid, in order in case all of a sudden all their depositors want all their money back and to avoid a, a bank run. Those are two different objectives. How do you do both? You do them carefully. Uh, banks also buy money from other people. And that's part of where you have to match the tenor to the lending tenor. Um, so that if you're if you're if the bank is borrowing a hundred million dollars for five years, they really should not make loans that go be or uh, exposures beyond five years. So the two things that they have that they can lend with are their deposits and also with their purchased money. Now up until the, a few decades ago, banks didn't make loans beyond one year for exactly the reason you described. Only all 100% of the loans go up until the late 70s and early 80s were uh, one year lines that were renewed because of the problem of matching tenors. Uh, we have gotten to, to banks making longer loans as they began to think they were more sophisticated but they had to put a buffer in place. And so that is the key thing here. You have to have a large enough buffer based on the nature of your business. So if you've got uh, widows and orphans with $50,000 deposits and millions of them, that's probably pretty sticky. If you've got high tech billionaires who are putting their IPO money in, that's very that's short term, and you got to, and you just have to restrict your activity to match that risk. And it's painful, yeah, it's, it, but that, well, but that's not. It sounds so basic. It can't. It can it really yeah. be that simple? Yeah, this is really basic. That's what's so embarrassing about. But 2008 was also embarrassing. People wanted to talk about fancy derivatives and fa and fancy problems. The majority of what happened in 2008 was cash liquidity. Banks borrowed short in 2008 because the, the it was so much cheaper to borrow 30 days than it was three years. And they also took onto their balance sheet a lot of very bad credit underwriting. But the biggest problem was actually the liquidity. The, the market dried up in 2008 so that there was no roll, you couldn't roll over. And banks had to go, some banks, not all, 
there were a number of banks who were in great shape, but there were a small number of banks and important names that you and I know that had to go hat in hand to the treasury and say, nobody will lend me money. And as soon as the money came back into the market, they were okay, but they needed the treasury for that period. So the two biggest problems, the, the existential risk in 2008 was the same thing that happened to Silicon Valley Bank. All the rest of that is noise. It's, I know it's in the popular mythology, but it, it, it was really basic rookie mistakes that were made and catastrophic. Okay, so we've gone over what's caused these bank runs and how, how do we fix some of the failures. After the break, we're going to talk about the FDIC, insured deposits, and some of the new regulations and new practices that are being discussed. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. What does the future of work mean for your employees? How will your company navigate ESG? Will there be a global recession? At the conference board, our experts translate the latest research and economic analysis into insights and real-time problem solving for your organization. Membership at the Conference Board provides your team with an assortment of knowledge from economics, marketing and communications, ESG, public policy, and human capital. As a member, you'll have access to our center experts, member-exclusive events, data and benchmarking tools, and peer sharing that will help you understand the present and shape the future. Consider becoming a conference board member today by visiting www.conference-board.org. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odden from the conference board, and I'm joined today by Hollis Hart, former head of international for City. So Hollis, talk about the FDIC, because you know in 1933, the FDIC was, was established. And, you know, the whole point here was to fix the bank run issue of the 30s so that all these deposits would be insured and depositors wouldn't have to worry about losing it. I mean, it started out, what, at $25,000, $2,500, and now it's been raised after the finan last financial crisis to $250,000. So should we, do we have to just insure everything? What's the practice? What should we do here? Well, the FDIC as you described it very accurately, was originally intended to protect widows and orphans. And so the amounts that were being covered were smaller. I think we're recognizing that that from a practical point of view uh, just doesn't work. We need to have, and I think there are a number of proposals right now, a much larger ceiling. Uh, there may be some structuring around that, such as we go to 5 million. I think uh, Elizabeth Warren mentioned even 10 million. Uh, but maybe you limit the amount of withdrawal on a given day so that small firms can make payrolls. I do think it's critical that there be a limit, though. There has to be accountability that people have to own some responsibility for deciding where they invest where they put their money, and it cannot be just a gut blanket government guarantee, which is I, the term of art is moral hazard, where people start relying exclusively on the government to protect them and use judgment. Okay, but it, but you could put limits on these things. I mean, pick your favorite number: five million, ten million. I mean, I, I, I'm throwing away, I'm throwing out a lot of money because yeah. the current number is two hundred fifty thousand, but. Um, that still doesn't cover, you know, these huge, you know, IPO deposits. It doesn't cover, you know, corporate banking. You know, the size of companies are huge. I mean, we're talking about having, in some cases, a billion dollars, you know, invested. So, and if it's if the moral hazard is there, and if these bank runs can happen because of stupid mistakes, as you said, I don't know if you use the term stupid, but mistakes. Um, then the government's going to always step in and it's going to be insured no matter what. So why not just formalize it and say everything's insured? I mean, I, I hear what you're saying on the moral hazard, but ultimately, doesn't it end up the same way? I would hope not, because I think that, in fact, there is real value to the health of the economy that people, in fact, can benefit on the one side, but are at risk on the other. It I think it's unhealthy for an economy if it's asymmetric, that you can only win and never lose. I do think you have to protect 
and provide stability to the marketplace. But I, people have to have responsibility for judging because we're talking right now about deposits. But there are other things that happen in the banking system, such as foreign exchange and derivatives. I mean, right now, the regulators have been silent whether the people who were owed money by Silicon Valley Bank in their big FX trades are going to, in fact, uh, be made whole or they're going to lose the money. The derivatives trades, the letters of credit, I, uh, there, ha there needs to be rules of the road and enforced. I, for one, and I may be in a minority, think that that President Biden and Secretary Yellen made a tremendous mistake. Uh, I they were they probably helped them a little bit politically, but th th an opportunity was lost for accountability. I think they could have drawn the line in the sand at some number, and and not reinforce the the moral hazard negative. But no, Steve, I think there has to be there has to be ownership and accountability in the market and unlimited coverage, I think takes that away, but that's my view. Yeah, okay, so that 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 says don't cover it 100%, but that's in effect what happened in 08 and 09, and that seems to be what's happening now because people are rushing to provide stability to the system. Um, but it sounds to me like, you know, you've got politicians all pointing the finger at each other. Um, it was interesting that, uh, you know, Donald Trump got blamed for stuff. Biden gets blamed for. But it, at some point, what I'm hearing you say is it comes back to the banks and the management of the banks because the mistakes were, you know, ABC kind of mistakes. I think that there are a number of stakeholders who have accountability. Uh, absolutely, management is critical. One of there used to be a acronym, CAMEL that was the byword for the industry, capital asset management earnings and liquidity. And management here was a, was a fail on both sides. There were, if you looked for subject matter experts running the bank or on the board, you had cosmetics or optics. You had a couple people from treasury, but they had not been in treasury alco types of roles. So if you had a New York Yankees HR person, you wouldn't want them to be your reliever in the ninth inning, even though they had worked for the New York Yankees. You need subject matter experts uh, in both the management roles and on the board, and that was missing. And frankly, that was within the regulatory purview. Regulators get nervous about that, but that's where they have to be stronger. The second thing is people get confused and they confuse the term capital with cash. In many people's minds, capital is cash, but it's not. Ca capital it can be an, a long-term asset uh, and that you can't sell easily or readily, or its value may have, in fact, uh, eroded. Cash is what meets needs. And so there was the the very the very term use of the terms can distract people from, in fact, what needs to happen. But yes, you're absolutely right. Management, you have to have the right people in the right roles with the right experience. And then you need to make sure that you're focusing on the right things. And in this case, they both start with C, but cash is not the same as capital. Well, and then you have the oversight. And you mentioned the boards of directors here. And, and boards of directors have you know, of these institutions had some expertise on it, but it's not like it used to be. I mean, there it used to be that you'd have all banking people on these boards who really had lived it and understood it. And that's just not the case today. So so even if they had went through all the motions and checked all the boxes, you, you still don't have the judgment, the people judgment, because you don't have the experience in the room. Yeah, unfortunately, Steve, I think you've nailed it. That's and it's it's not that they're not good people or smart or bright, but they don't have the necessary technical experience. You need to have been through business cycle and you need to see that, the, that for example, the commercial paper market, not just A2P2, but A1P1 can disappear. If someone who has never seen liquidity disappear or has never seen interest rates spike just can't imagine what types of buffer and safety and banks are 
are fairly crude objects, you have to, you cannot have precision. You need to create a buffer because there's so many subjective variables that you can't control and you don't know the outcome. So the banks have to have create buffers. And the important buffer is cash liquidity. Well, you know, some of this is just that uh, the risk profiles of, of these banks are not what they used to be. I mean, it, and so you could, I mean, the one way to think of it is you, these these institutions need to be run more conservatively, and that's the whole tenor issue and and so forth. It, you know, in the in the old days, whether they were good or bad old days, but in the olden days, um, and you and I can say that to each other, um, you had a situation where banks were either family owned or they were partnership owned. So, you know, the people in charge were using their own money. And, you know, I, I don't know if you agree. I think you'd agree that, but the risk profiles that they took, the risk that they took was far less. Now, today, most of these banks are public, meaning publicly traded, you know, stock is traded publicly and it, which, which helps because you raise a lot more capital from a broader uh, environment. But at the same time, the risk profile seems to have changed. Well, Steve, Steve, I'm smiling. I, I there's a there's a great deal of truth to what you've described. I think of two situations though that that counter. One is I I was and I'll, I'll I think I could say it publicly uh, the lead banker for Brown Brothers Harriman, which is the last major partnership, and you would hear the senior partners talk about the fact that they managed their risk profile because it was 100% their own money. And you're absolutely right. That was how they thought about it. And that kept them from being overly aggressive. But on the other hand, I was also the lead banker for a short time for Hugh McCall, one of the most aggressive bankers in the country. And when he was running Nations Bank and what's today Bank of America. And at a dinner, Hugh said to me when I said, I could have led that deal cheaper, less expensive, he said in that wonderful deep Southern voice, House, I take business risk. I don't take financial risk. So Steve, <laughs> to your point, I think these large firms can, uh, in fact, even though they are shareholder driven, but they have to have prudential management that keeps a risk reward balance. And that's where the regulators do have a role and it has to be a proactive role. It can't be an after the after the fact car crash photo. So okay, so so let's bring this home now because you know in the last couple of minutes. So basically, then, what the, what needs to change right now in the system in order to prevent this from happening again? It, it sounds like it's a combination of of risk management within the companies and regulatory processes to, to Steve, provide that. I'm yeah. going to take it to a higher level. I okay. First, I don't think we can ever eliminate an individual anecdotal situation, but we can reduce the risk. But number one, one of the biggest things that has to happen is actually at the political level. There, the, the U.S. public policy arena, the politicians, do not support the regulators, the same way the best in class, best practice regulators uh, get supported. We we treat them, if you look at historic examples, for example, when the regulators for Fannie and Freddie tried to tighten mortgage underwriting, the U.S. Congress beat them up and threatened to even close down their agencies because they were trying to tighten mortgage. We need to okay. strengthen the support for the regulators. We need to have them know that the, that the government and the public policy have their backs. We need to pay them better. We need to give them better tools. That is, that's a major thing. We actually need to uh, get our regulation to align on a risk reward basis. Yes, small financial institutions should have a degree of oversight. They need to have stress tests and living wills make perfect sense for them, but they can't be 50,000 page documents. They really should be the size that's proportionate with the risk. We do not do that today. And we've got to be focusing on the things that matter. The cash and liquidity should be absolutely paramount. So should should the regu but should the regulators then regulate the uh, the tenors so that 
that they force them to match oh, tenants? That's absolutely part of their what they should be doing, and they and is critical for them to be doing. One of the things that's happened, which we haven't talked about, is probably for another session, is that by having the excessive regulation, banks have withdrawn from whole segments of the market, and those segments of the markets have moved to unregulated third parties, shadow banking, which is a massive risk. And it's unregulated, but now large enough in economic scale that, in fact, there you can have some blowups. And so one of the one of the negative consequences of bad regulation was the fact that uh, there is now a massive shadow banking type of activity taking place with no transparency, no control, and no oversight. Okay, so what I hear you saying is align the political and the regulatory uh, process, make sure that they're aligned, make sure that there's risk, the risk profiles are lowered, make sure that, you know, the regulatory catches up with the tenors, make sure that there's cash available, the cash window is always open, and things like that. So these are, these are what you would call the ABCs of, of banking here, I think, right? And I would argue that if you get the ABCs right, you, you're going to get an A on the exam, that very seldom, very seldom, are the issues or the problems that occur anything other than core basic issues? You, if you do the fundamentals right, you'll get you'll get an A on on your outcome. Hollis Hart, thanks as always for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. I'm flattered that you took the time to listen to me. And thanks to all of you for listening into CEO Perspectives. Please share CEO Perspectives with everybody you know. I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You have been listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.